This is a little unusual. <laughs> I like to keep on eye contact with people, but for some of you, it's going to be difficult. <laughs> Okay, uh, so my topic is, uh, is, of course, computer graphics, because that's my area is computer graphics. And uh, I've become particularly uh, concerned uh, or interested in uh, techniques for analysis uh, as opposed to scanning. So I'll, I'll give you a, a little overview of how I, I got to this point. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the projects that uh, Roberto has uh, already uh, mentioned. And then sort of the, 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 uh, the meat uh, of the talk will be uh, describing a taxonomy uh, that we, uh, that along with some colleagues, uh, we developed for analysis techniques. And, and then, um, uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, in, in, in the spirit of uh, keeping the revolution going, where do we move forward? One thing a taxonomy does uh, is it uh, allows us to uh, identify where there's blank spaces and opportunities to do new work. It allows us to identify what's already been done so we don't bother spending a lot of time reinventing some things. And for uh, ideas of how to uh, move forward. I'll talk about uh, some things we're learning uh, uh, from a couple of ongoing projects I have. So, uh, first of all, so how I how I got here, uh, as Roberto mentioned, in the late uh, '90s, uh, I got into this project um, making a, a 3D scan of Michelangelo's Florence Pietà. Um, why did I do this? I was working at IBM and I was assigned. It was my job. So, I mean, it was, it's a lovely job, but that's how it happened. Uh, and uh, in doing it, uh, the big uh, interest from a technical point of view is there were a lot of technical challenges. Uh, scanning <laughs> scanning uh, 15 years ago was different than it is today. Uh, just uh, getting the scans registered and uh, positioned to one another was uh, even more of a pain in the neck than it is now. Uh, merging all the points in a point cloud into a single mesh uh, was, uh, there were not great ways to do that. And also we wanted to uh, develop this new scanning technique that combined uh, projected patterns and photometric stereo uh, in order to get uh, uh, normals at a higher resolution than the geometry. Uh, and you can see the downside of using this uh, semi-homemade little uh, scanner uh, was that uh, we got very little patches, so which is why uh, the geometry was such a nightmare. We had 800 scans uh, around uh, this uh, this work uh, in order it, that needed to be registered and merged. So there was lots of interesting technical stuff. IBM filed eight patents on the various ideas uh, we did, uh, but you don't uh, you don't produce models uh, purely because oh gee, wouldn't that be technically interesting? Um, uh, what do you do with the scan? And we were doing this uh, for a study by an art historian, uh, Jack Wasserman. And a couple of the things he was uh, interested in was, first of all, was having very fine control over the viewpoint, because he was interested in studying how did Michelangelo want this work to be viewed by the, uh, by the, by the, by the person looking at the artwork. And then sort of the, the, the killer app, the thing that sold IBM, like, oh, this would be really cool to do, was parts of the, of the statue had uh, been removed by Michelangelo himself. And so the big question was, why? And so he, uh, Professor Wasserman, had his own theory of what uh, uh, Michelangelo wanted to do with the work. So he wanted them, these pieces to be removed digitally so he could see what the form would be. And he wrote a book justifying his theory then. So then the other, the other uh, following, you know, we were successful, so we got a following project. And that was scanning uh, artifacts in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And uh, there were new challenges. We had to have a very robust, complete pipeline because we weren't going to do all the scanning ourselves. We were building a system that we would give to our colleagues in Egypt who would be doing uh, the bulk of the scanning. Uh, and uh, a lot of the most famous works uh, in, 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 in Egypt uh, are, are the most uh, optically uncooperative things you can find. Uh, they're very dark uh, materials, uh, like uh, this, uh, this, this full-size 
uh, statue is, is really very dark. All the brightness is coming from specular reflection, which you do not want when you're doing a laser scan. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the throne of Tutankhamun. It's, uh, no, you do not want a totally specular object. It's a, it's a nightmare. So uh, we had to develop techniques to deal with these uh, uncooperative materials. And then just uh, editing, editing both the scans and the models, because we weren't going to do this all ourselves. We had to develop methods that were uh, convenient for our colleagues. And uh, again, it, it's not like, oh, it, well, that's technically interesting, so that's a, a good reason to do it. Uh, the outcomes were uh, this website. Uh, it's still, uh, it's still, you can still go to it. Um, and th uh, that's a, a really wonderful outcome that uh, this was built more than 10 years ago, and you can still go to www.eternalegypt.org. Uh, after uh, a couple of years, IBM stopped maintaining it, and our colleagues in Egypt at Cultnet uh, took it over and continue to uh, keep it up to date. So uh, uh, things we did with the 3D models on the site uh, were things like uh, illustrating how uh, these, these, uh, these scanned objects would be used. You know, this is a lamp. What would the lamp look like when it was lit? This is a fire starter. How would you start a fire with it? And actually, we went in a lot more back and forth with experts about animating that fire starter. That was actually quite a project in itself. So I will not give you a rundown of all sorts of other intervening uh, projects, but I'll sort of jump to uh, one that I'm working on now. And these uh, this is, these are uh, involves analyzing um, many busts of Alexander Pope, the poet. Uh, that were made by the artist Rubiliac. Um, and this picture that you see on, on the left is uh, from an exhibit from 50 years ago that a Yale professor had organized of getting uh, private owners to lend uh, these uh, busts of, of Pope. And it's important because uh, uh, Alexander Pope was a new kind of celebrity in the 18th century, and getting uh, people buying your bust was part of their celebrity praise at the time. So uh, that's the, uh, the, the, the interest in, in these busts. Uh, and now, uh, last year, we had a repeat of the gathering of the busts for an exhibit, and we actually had three more. So this is a perfect opportunity to scan them all. And of course, at this point, you know, um, you know, you know, we're pushing 15, 20 years since I started in this. The scanning's pretty routine. You know, you can always make things better, cheaper, faster, but there was no part of this project that was screaming for a big new technical innovation in scanning. It's just, just do it. You know, here's the scanner, here's the objects, do it. So the challenge here is the analysis. We have nine busts, and we have a, a, an art historian, Malcolm Baker, who is interested in analyzing uh, Robiliac's technique and how it changed in different media and different time. So we can do all sorts of analysis. We can compute all sorts of shape descriptors. We can compute distances. These two color images are two of the other busts uh, color mapped with various uh, values. I could show you, we have probably hundreds of color coded bust heads now <laughs> with different kinds of analysis. So the question was, you know, um, one thing is, surely other people have done this. And what did they do that worked, that provided insight? And what are things that other people haven't tried? What, how can we know this? And so uh, this inspired uh, this idea of doing the survey and the taxonomy. Uh, you know, we need to get out there and find, you know, we have a pretty good <laughs> grip on, uh, on scanning. We know the classes of scanning. Uh, we know sort of the progress in that. Uh, yeah, so, so, so we know where we stand in scanning. But then using uh, the scans, using the geometry, analyzing it to answer questions uh, about, about artistic practice, about culture, uh, about history, we really don't have a good grip on the state of the art in, in geometric analysis. So a group of us uh, uh, from uh, CRS4 in uh, Sardinia, um, uh, UCL, uh, University College in London, and, and, and those of us at Yale um, got together and decided, okay, let's, let's do a survey of, of uh, not, not, not the process of acquiring models, 
but the process of uh, once you have a model, analyzing them to answer some question that some uh, somebody outside of computer science or computer vision actually wants to uh, wants the answer to. And uh, we presented this at the uh, graphics uh, uh, Eurographics workshop on cultural heritage last fall, and uh, we are just uh, we've been through the journal review process. We're in the last minor. Uh, revisions and we'll be having a, a journal paper online very soon. So you can you can find all the references and so forth that, uh, in that. Um, so we have over a hundred examples, which you would think, oh, a hundred is not that many. How hard is that to get? Well, actually, uh, you know, there there the number of different journals or different conferences, conference series uh, that we had to go through. Uh, you know, it was almost as big as the number of examples. This stuff shows up all over the place. Even in computing, there's graphics, there's multiple graphics outlets, vision, document analysis. There are multiple journals in archaeology that uh, have uh, this kind of analysis reported. And then in the engineering literature, there's optical engineering, civil engineering, they all have results. So it's, it's one reason to have the taxonomy is we all need a place to take all this experiment information <laughs> and put it in one place so that we can navigate and find out what other people have done. So uh, looking back uh, at, at computer graphics and how people have used it, uh, we do have a lot of uh, previous uh, surveys uh, on, on things like uh, uh, da databases people have uh, uh, built and uh, uh, communication <laughs> techniques that people have used with models. And there have been uh, some um, other specialized uh, 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 surveys. But an analysis that we want to uh, focus on is uh, uh, projects that are asking questions about how was this made, why was this made, uh, how, how has it changed through time, how close is it to what it was. So uh, those are the kinds of, of things we're looking for both so that people working in cultural heritage can find uh, similar projects <laughs> and then also uh, so that we in graphics can know where are the open questions, where are things where we could really spend time solving some technical problems that would help move other people along in their work. And there have been uh, some surveys in some various uh, areas uh, like uh, uh, illumination and, and illumination analysis is one kind uh, of analysis you could do. Uh, and there are also some non-cultural heritage uh, surveys about different kinds of geometric analysis, computing different shape descriptors, different uh, distances uh, that are also somewhat related. But we didn't really find uh, what, uh, what we wanted to do here was uh, what are the analysis projects in cultural heritage. And so we started, we started finding them and we started organizing them. And you know, basically there were the three groups. And uh, we, we'd organize it one way and then another way. And I guess I shouldn't move around. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we would organize them in different ways and argue about it. And eventually we decided, you know, we need a taxonomy. Uh, I try to use this one and let's see. Okay, um, all right, hopefully. So we decided to organize a, 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 a taxonomy, and we found uh, ultimately, and, and this was more the genius of my colleagues than, than it is my idea, but we, we found three axes that we felt worked for this classification. And one is the geometric scale, ranging uh, from micro to meso, to macro. And then uh, the number of objects involved in the analysis, going from single, one to many, and then many to many. And then uh, the cultural heritage application. Um, this axis, uh, I don't, you know, don't worry about the ordering on this axis, that somehow one is <laughs> greater than the other. That's the one axis that doesn't work uh, quantitatively. But there's perception, restoration, monitoring, interpretation, and collection analysis. So perhaps the, 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 the scale, uh, the size, needs the most explanation. 
Micro means not, uh, not microscopic or molecular level, but it means what can you say about a point? Uh, can you, uh, is, the, uh, is, is the surface flat at this point, or is it have a high curvature of, at this point? So you may need to use a surrounding uh, geometry to compute this, but you can associate this property with a point. So that's what we are calling microanalysis. And then macro, we're talking about uh, objects. And the object may be a, a, a vase or, or a lamp, or the object may be a, a landscape. So uh, a, a, an object, but with a very generous definition of what an object is. And then meso is in between. It's a portion uh, of an object, a region on an object. And this idea came from a, a paper uh, in, in robotics that was doing uh, some, some classification. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to give you an exhaustive uh, list of all the examples we found because that would be really exhausting, but I'll give you some samples so you get a feeling for what the various areas in the taxonomy mean. So the first, starting with uh, the, the micro scale and a single object and addressing perception. And, uh, and that means, uh, in, in one sense, to, uh, to enhance uh, the, 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 the perception of the shape of an object in order to make it readable, something very important in reading like cuneiform. So we can remove, it, remove the, the uh, actual object texture, which is really easy because it was a pain to get in the first place. <laughs> so it's, it's very easy to remove the, uh, the actual uh, color and texture of an object. And then we can compute at a point uh, uh, variables like uh, its ambient occlusion. That is, from this point, how much of the world above it is obscured by the object itself? That's the so-called ambient occlusion. If we make it darker uh, uh, as a function of its ambient occlusion, uh, we get the kind of result that we see here in, in, in the lower uh, image. We can also compute uh, other uh, geometric features, uh, for example, uh, the curvature or uh, a areas of, uh, of inflection of the curvature. And when we connect those points, we get uh, things that are akin to uh, a line drawing of the key features. So that's another way of making uh, 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 the, these, uh, these uh, shapes on, on the object more easily, to, more easily perceived, easier to read uh, characters and so forth. A many-to-many -many restoration that depends on local analysis is, uh, is uh, having many uh, fragments of an object that you want to put together and doing that reassembly based on computing things like, say, curvature at each point on the object. And th this is, uh, it's been a, uh, an area of, 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 of lots of interest in, in computer graphics. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a problem that has a, a lot of variance. You can assume that things were broken and all the fractures are perfect, or you can introduce some models for how what now are the edges imperfect. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting problem. And then another variant of this is to couple the geometric variations at a point with other things like uh, coupling also the color. Uh, an example of this is this uh, work of uh, assembling uh, uh, frescoes from um, from uh, uh, Princeton University and their work in Greece. So just uh, not to go through all of them, uh, and in our taxonomy we find that at the micro scale we have many uh, single uh, object applications making them more readable, and then many of these many to many taking many fragments and putting them together uh, uh, applications. So perception restoration, the big, uh, uh, the big values on these axes. Uh, in the, in the, moving on to then the meso range, maybe the hardest to get a, a feel for, this is treating an area on the surface. And uh, this is a project I like very much. This is from uh, my colleagues in, um, at, at University College London, where these, are, these things you see laying here are um, Irish tax records that are in a museum in London, and they were on uh, some uh, some like a parchment and curled up, and uh, you can't you, you would destroy them if you physically tried to flatten them. 
but you know, you've got all these patch records, how can you read them? So first they, they captured uh, the, the, the 3D uh, shape, uh, and, and this shows an exa example of chasm doing that with shape from motion. And then they developed a, a, a technique where there's local flattening. So as you go along on the object, it doesn't try to flatten the whole object, but just the region that you're looking at to read. So even though you have this uh, very uh, re and really bumpy object, uh, when you're looking at this part of it, it will automatically flatten out just that region. So then you can read the, uh, the text. Uh, they later uh, went on for an algorithm that flattened the whole thing, but I, I think this has interesting applications for other things, so something to keep in mind. It's very, it's very nice. Uh, another single uh, object mesostructure is using a, a, a photometric stereo to, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, sorry. Uh, to find where there are creases in regions of the photograph in order to repair those creases digitally to uh, correct uh, damage to photographs. And uh, another use of region is to characterize uh, the, uh, a region and uh, uh, the, like a size of a hole or the size of the start of a handle in order to do database queries to find not the exact same object, but similar objects. Okay. Um, another example. <laughs> Okay, uh, another example would be uh, finding this shape of a goblet on a coin to find similar coins. So that's just looking for one particular region on each coin. Another kind of thing is uh, a many-to-many -many reassembly task again. In this case, taking advantage uh, of the fact that uh, potteries are uh, uh, are um, uh, surfaces of, uh, of revolution. So finding uh, multiple pieces that all have the same uh, radius of curvature for the whole piece allows you to help uh, reassemble the, the object. So overall on the mesoscale, we see a little bit more distribution in the numbers, but we still, uh, our big winner is there's lots of applications where people are doing restoration. I think one reason is restoration is a very easy uh, task for those of us in graphics to grasp. Like, okay, you broke something, you want to put it back together. It's an easy question for us to understand, probably easier than a lot of the other questions that you all face. So moving to the macro, working on, uh, on the object scale. So one thing for uh, using the whole object is uh, and perhaps a classic problem is you have a, a seal that you need to roll into a medium to see the picture doing that digitally. So you can see the whole uh, picture without having to use the seal physically. Uh, another uh, example is uh, 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 writings that have been stored, uh, curled up, and now they are so fragile you can't just physically uncurl them. But you can do volumetric scanning, like an, a, a CT scan, and look at the variation of densities in the CT scan and develop a model of that surface, and then virtually unroll the surface and read it. This is a, an example from, from Roberto's group. Uh, you know, another thing you can do on, on, on the full object is things like uh, analysis. Uh, for, for restoration, conservation, where the mass of the whole object on the various portions uh, of the work uh, have an impact on, on how, to, uh, how to conserve the object. Another uh, kind of museum application, and I, I think uh, that the various uh, groups have found uh, variations of, is uh, making packing material that's custom designed for the shape of a, of a museum object. You get the shape and then you can use your MC machine or your 3D printing, whatever, to make an exact, uh, an exact uh, fit for transporting an object. 
and more relevant to your domain and probably something that a lot of you have done um, is uh, tracking uh, the, the shape uh, of the landscape as an archaeological dig proceeds. That's another single object we think of the, of, of the site being <coughs> excavated as the object. Another uh, example of si single object is, uh, is monitoring uh, the, uh, the, the state of large structures, for exam example, scanning in detail uh, the shape and, and, and detail of, of, of a bridge over time. And then uh, another large scale uh, uh, application single object where the object is the landscape is using geometric techniques to separate uh, uh, natural, like uh, trees and so forth from, is it, is it getting louder? <laughs> okay, good. So another uh, path is interpretation and using uh... <laughs> Oh, okay. As long as you can hear me. But, uh, <laughs> so separating out uh, natural objects like trees from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, man-made structures in say uh, a, a lidar scan uh, made from uh, from an airplane. Uh, another uh, another interpretation uh, uh, task is uh, is analyzing uh, a statue that has uh, perhaps lost a part of something that went with it. For example, in this case, examining uh, what was in the hand of the figure. Was it the rein of a horse? Was it a spear? What was he holding? Doing a detailed analysis of the geometry of the hand to understand what the original uh, uh, sculpture looked like. In a, in a macro one-to-many uh, uh, scenario is when there's a drawing with something missing in it, finding many similar drawings and then using the information from those similar drawings to fill in uh, the missing piece. Another one-to-many is to do uh, a search uh, from uh, given a shape, finding similar shapes in uh, a database. And, and uh, this can be useful to finding uh, where did this, what is the provenance of this particular piece? What is it similar to that we know something about? In a, in a many to many scenario, this uh, example from, uh, from uh, the Kyuchi's group in, in, in Japan is uh, they scanned a, a, a temple in Cambodia and, and there are many, many faces all over it. But some of them are facing each other directly with a very narrow gap. So there's no way to go in and take a, a picture of that face. They're very high up facing each other. But they can get part of it. So they can take the parts they can get and compare to all the other faces that they were able to scan and make a reasonable guess of what do those faces that were too, too close to each other to get, what they, what they may have looked like. And finally, uh, in another many-to-many -many example, we found uh, actually a, a more than one example of people who've done uh, analysis comparing multiple busts. I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, I don't know if it's a popular thing to do, but it's not an unusual thing to do. Uh, in this case, it is uh, looking at uh, the most uh, uh, unusual feature of each of these uh, heads of, uh, of Augustus. There was also, uh, here in our own neighborhood, there was a, a, a similar um, a, a project to ours examining bust of Benjamin Franklin, which is very relevant because he was another 18th century celebrity that people were all getting buying busts of. So um, our, our goal now is to take what they've done, do at least that, and then push further and see what more we can do with our project. On the, on, the, on the macro scale, we see lots and lots of projects uh, with uh, single objects and, 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 and doing some analysis on a single object. And of course, we see more restoration and a, a, a bit of monitoring and, and interpretation. And just recapping, uh, sort of summarizing, uh, following the geometric scale, uh, the numbers of objects that we see in, in analysis uh, task and looking at, uh, uh, again, following the geometric scale, 
looking at uh, cultural heritage uh, applications. And looking at it yet another way, we have uh, the, 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 the micro, mezzo, and macro scales, and then uh, and then repeating with each of those single ones, many, many, and the various uh, applications. And uh, we see that there are some very highly populated uh, areas uh, in the, um, in the, in the, particularly in the restoration uh, related and in the single object. And we have some gaps. And uh, our conclusion is a, a couple of gaps is perhaps a, a fault of the taxonomy. Maybe uh, saying many to many or one to many for microanalysis is not something that's useful. It's maybe ill-posed kind of analysis. On the other hand, it seems like these, uh, this, this lower here, where the one-to-many and many-to-many for uh, macro scale, it seems like we should be able to populate those. That's where there's some real opportunity. And we feel the problem is we just don't have the collections yet. I mean, we have loads and loads of scans. People all over the world have been scanning like crazy. There are loads of models out there. But they, they aren't organized into collections, and I know some of them are. There's various efforts to do that, but this is where um, we um, are, are really uh, 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 need, need something. So our, uh, to recap our taxonomy, it's got these three axes. And then uh, the, the big, uh, the big need, and, and doing the whole exercise, we did solve our initial inspiring problem, which is uh, finding what other people have done in, in terms of analyzing the geometry of must. And I hope that other people will be able to navigate and find a, a, a similar uh, projects to projects that they're starting. And then we have this goal that we really need uh, comparative studies, which means we need collections, not just loads of objects floating around, but uh, collections. And uh, even more than just getting them in the same place and having some objects <coughs> metadata. So let me uh, talk a little bit about my current projects and what, what I mean by that. And the two projects are one we call Dozen. And the other one is data for the object built heritage conservation, which is new enough we don't have any handy data in the world we use for it yet. So DESM is digitally enabled scholarship of manuscripts. Uh, it's a project that's funded by the Mellon Foundation. It's a collaboration that we have with Stanford, the Stanford Libraries actually, not Stanford CS. And it's a continuation of of Project Stanford has had to make interoperable collections. We all want to be interoperable, right? Uh, and, and, and frankly, uh, when I first came to this, uh, I was sort of like, how hard can this be? I mean, 3D is hard, but they've got, it's like pages. Take a picture, put it in, put it in a file with some metadata, <laughs> you're done. How, why is this a problem? But then you get into it, you find out why it is. Um, initially, a lot of libraries did their own manuscripts. And then they said, okay, I'll put, we'll make a viewer. And everybody had their own viewer. You want to look at a, a manuscript from London, you want to look at a manuscript from California, you get, bring up two different viewers and look for the pages and try to look at them the same way. So the first step was to get everybody to use uh, the IIIF uh, standardization for uh, uh, image formats and then have a common, openly accessible uh, viewer that you can uh, bring in the manuscripts from everybody's collections. And that alone is great, so uh, a scholar doesn't have to bring up lots of different windows. But, you know, and that's great, you know, um, I have this book of hours in this hunting collection, I want this page, and this book of hours that was in uh, Wales, I want that page, I want to look at them together. But how do you know those pages are what you want to look for? Um, the one um, project I'm working with in, in this context uh, is a woman studying a uh, you know, many, many copies of the books of ours, and she's looking for the places uh, where they are not the standard book of ours. They have not the standard prayers, but other things that people snuck in, uh, because uh, her, her thesis, is, or her, uh, her contention is that the book of ours was the only book people ever saw. 
this was their idea of a book. And for a large population, their idea of what can you do with a book started with the Book of Hours and stuff that people started, little poems and so forth. People put in the Book of Hours. So she'd like to contrast uh, various things that are in the Book of Hours across many of these, uh, many of these copies. But you know, how do you do that to a page? One, one thing you can do is manual uh, annotation and, uh, and, and make use of the fact that many people are studying these same works and uh, discovering information that they can now annotate in a common way, in a common database, and then you can access and then you can do queries. But, and, and so at least you, you, we're building up the database of knowledge of the experts in a way that other people can subsequently access them. But we can, we can do more. And uh, one thing we're doing is, uh, is, is automated analysis of all the pages to do things like identify this is text, this is a figure. And then once you have that, oh, this, uh, this text is actually a capital letter. Or this figure is uh, very uh, short and long. Or this, this, this figure has so many colors. So we're doing all that kind of analysis across thousands of pages. <laughs> and then we get to the point where, um, so, so we say we automatically uh, classify capital letters. We automatically classify these long line fillers, these figures that are very short and long. Then a scholar can come along later and say, you know, if you have a bunch of capital letters followed by a bunch of line fillers, that's a litany. I want to see all of it in pages. Now, if we pre-process them into these basic uh, primitive things, rather than starting out with uh, just a bunch of uh, a pile of TIFF files and looking, is this a litany, is this a litany, you have a big head start on the analysis and you can do queries much, much faster because the uh, analysis has been pre-computed. So this is the first thing I would like to suggest in developing collections. Besides putting in the geometric models and the, the, the metadata of what they represent and everything else about them, uh, let's think about what can we compute for those geometries, what features, so that when people do searches, they're not just dependent on textual searches. Uh, they can actually search on different kinds of geometric features as well to find uh, the objects or places that they're interested in. And we may not know what combination is going to be useful in the future for someone's study, but we know what the primitives are. Those can be very expensive to compute. Let's just do it now and store them. But we have to figure out what the good candidates for that kind of pre-processing could be, but that can really speed up this use of collections. So my other project, which is relatively new, is this data for built uh, for object and, and built heritage conservation. So ranging from things like paintings in the museum to, to buildings. And this is through, um, Yale has a so-called Institute of Preservation of Cultural Heritage. And this is a project I have uh, with, with, with that staff. Uh, the previous project is with um, uh, uh, members of humanities departments, uh, uh, English and uh, history at Yale. So that the, the, this started out with, you know, uh, I think many of you are conservators, so you know there's also data comes from all sorts of instruments. And every instrument comes with its own viewer to understand that data. And many of these instruments uh, in, 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 in heritage were always inheriting from, oh, this instrument was from medicine, this instrument was from about sensing. We're inheriting stuff. So there's a lot of uh, software out there for viewing the results, but it's always designed for somebody else, and you have to sort of get used to it. So it's, it's a very difficult environment to try to synthesize a view of, of an object. So uh, in our previous project funded by the, the Seeker <coughs> Foundation, we developed this open uh, source uh, viewer that brings in multiple data types, whether it's the, the 3D scan, a CAT scan, uh, just various sorts of images, and lets you look in one coherent viewer. So they're all up at the same time. You don't have to open many programs. And uh, the key thing is they all have consistent gestures. If you want to zoom on an image or zoom on a model, it's the same gesture. You're not constantly stopping yourself because you're doing a move for another program. It also lets you do things like uh, 
to take hyperspectral data and uh, examine what is the spectrum at any particular uh, point. And it lets you uh, change the lighting, where the, the lighting uh, change affects all of the panels in the, in the same way. So that was our first effort, but it's just about viewing. It's not attempting to do any analysis. It's not building the models. We have mesh labs, so we don't need to reinvent how to uh, to uh, uh, take our scan data and, and make the model. We wanted to avoid reinventing any of that, but this is just to allow easy viewing. But now the next step is to integrate all the data into, in, in, in the uh, manuscript project, for each manuscript page we have the concept of one canvas. There may be multiple scanned images for that page, but they all belong to the same canvas. And we can register and keep them to each other on that canvas so that all the annotations from one version of the manuscript propagate to the other. So now we want to have a 3D space that we put all the relevant data for this uh, conservation data and so that we can integrate them uh, together. And uh, this, uh, and this includes not just the imaging data that we were preoccupied with in our previous but it includes all the chemical analysis at various points, microwave analysis, X-ray fluorescence, all of the different, you know, people keep files and files in these different analysis. We want to put them in all in one place. First of all, for the uh, conservator to get a view of the individual object in its state. And then also, you can take classes of objects and export a particular data type for that class of objects. So what people would like to do things is, uh, crack of earth on paintings. We would like to get uh, analysis of, of paintings with, in that state from many different galleries so you can uh, compare their state and compare their treatment and uh, have some more insight into how to take care of this work. And this, uh, this, uh, all of this idea really came from this meeting that was uh, organized uh, by the Getty Conservation Institute uh, about a year and a half ago. And out of that uh, meeting, different uh, different efforts are, are, are starting. And you, and you think, well, shouldn't you all work together? Why do you have separate efforts? And, well, they, they are separate but coordinated. And, and I was talking uh, about this uh, yesterday in the, in the landscapes of the cloud. There's two ways to solve a problem, top down and bottom up. And the question is, you always argue about which is right. And the answer is always, both. You have to go bottom up to figure out what, 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 what are we doing? But you have to have top down to have a nice, elegant, final design. So you need both. Um, and uh, our colleagues at the Getty are doing the top down. They're studying use cases and developing ontologies uh, for describing uh, the data. Meanwhile, we're going bottom up. We're going to, we're going to, we do what we've done with our viewer, now knowing things that are good and bad about it. And then we're going to start building up this structure inside uh, that viewer so that when people are thinking about integrated data, they have something to look at and they can say, oh, this is bad, or this is good. And we can inform the top-down process by people experimenting with an actual system. And I think this is something we can learn about in general in developing uh, uh, collections is you can't do it all ahead of time. You can't do it all top down. Uh, doing it bottom up is, you know, I expect that we're going to have to throw away lots of software as we do this. And people say, like, no, not that. But we have to have something to start with. So it's, it's good to have multiple groups taking different approaches and then to share the information about the top down and, and the bottom up. So I really appreciate the invitation to come here and to speak with you all over the place. <laughs> and I really thank you for your attention. And I really do want feedback uh, on the taxonomy. The taxonomy, maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe we should have a new one, but I think we should have one. So I'd love feedback on it. Also, we're still doing minor revisions for our articles. So if you go on projects who think should go in there, let me know so that we can add them before we do this. And of course, online, I would like to keep this uh, up to date. I'd like to know about other projects and collection analysis. And just as a side note from yesterday, if you have any projects in Dora Eurotis, I also would like to hear about those. So thank you very much.